Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, updates about upcoming guests, and you'll get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. I mentioned last week that it was a pretty hectic week. Uh, there's more hectic time ahead. Um, I will do my best to keep the show coming out on schedule, though. Um, this week, in fact, this afternoon, I'm off to D.C. for some lobbying visits, weather permitting. Um, they're expecting a giant snowstorm, and we'll see if any of this ends up happening. I only have a few hours left to find out. So um, after that, I've got a Philadelphia trip for a trustee function of mine, as well as a podcast. And then I'll hopefully, or I hope, uh, be recording some shows over the weekend before going to two simultaneous conferences in New York City next week and holding my quarterly board meeting while I'm there for my day job. So uh, I will be running around a lot. Plus side is I already have next week's show uh, recorded, and I'm hoping, like I said, to get three more done uh, over the course of this week, which will put us in pretty good shape. Uh, now, this weekend, I did not record a show, but I did have a good conversation. I um, I connected with an old pal of mine. We, we went to the New York Antiquarian Book Fair at the Park Avenue Armory, I went last year by myself, um, but it was good that this pal of mine could connect with me this time. He used to be a used or antiquarian book dealer and had all sorts of stories about some of the, the vendors who were there. Um, neither of us bought anything, um, although I, I did think about buying the original art for Billy Strayhorn's Lush Life record from Duke Ellington's collection. Um, it would have been an anniversary present for my wife, who loves and cries to that song. Unfortunately... Um, it cost $20,000, which was a bit more than I was willing to pony up. So um, for our anniversary yesterday, I took her out for a nice lunch instead. Um, anyway, I wrote about the book fair experience in this week's email, so you can read more about that there. Um, the upside is, uh, let's see. I was riding on a subway in New York City sa uh, Saturday morning without my studio in a bag with me, and I felt unarmed, because that is the context in which I am normally traveling in New York nowadays. Uh, I've got my mics, my recorders, my cables, etc. This time I didn't. And connecting with my old pal and talking for a couple of hours while looking at antiquarian books and, and great old ephemera, um, that sort of reminded me of... Um, the joy of having a conversation that isn't being recorded for posterity, I guess. Um, and it kind of puts us in a position of talking about this week's show. But as I was mentioning, I wrote about the Antiquarian Book Fair experience in this week's email. If you don't get the email, go to vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm and uh, go to any of the episodes. There's a sign-up uh, form there so you can actually just put in your email, get the weekly thing. It's really less about the current episode and more about uh, me and my oddball reveries, I suppose. Um, anyway, I like writing that email every week. Uh, it, like I said, is a sort of mini essay reverie type thing. Uh, the thing is, this week's guest would consider weekly to be kind of a lazy uh, production schedule for that. See, every day, this Princeton literature professor, Je uh, Jeff Nunakawa, he posts 
an essay or a reminiscence or something in, in writing using Facebook notes. And he's the only guy who knows how to use Facebook notes, apparently. Uh, but it's a really neat medium. And over a decade, he's built this immense and unique body of work in a, a hybrid kind of literary form. See, notes, Facebook notes isn't exactly a blog format because A, it's contained within Facebook. B, the text can't be hyperlinked except to other Facebook users. So you can't really link out to other sources. You can't embed images besides the one in the header. Um, you get this large readership of regular followers in the Facebook garden, and they're more prone to comment than somebody would on a blog. It's um, It's a different thing. Now, in 2015, Princeton University Press published a collection of notes, uh, of Jeff's notes, in a book called Notebook. Um, Langdon Hammer, the author of James Merrill, Life and Art, who I had a great conversation with two years ago, cited it as his favorite book that year, and he suggested that I get together with Jeff to record a show sometime. Um, for which, Langdon, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the prompt. Uh, Notebook, the collection, is it's impressive. But Jeff has some serious ambivalence about it, and I, I also found myself torn while, while reading it. Um, that is, it's great to have like a best of compilation of Jeff's notes because they really are these sort of profound and interesting mini essays, it's sort of in a Montaigne kind of way, you know, coming out of Jeff's unique experience into the, the, you know, the human, the human universal, I guess. Um, but at the same time, the whole thing about it being a printed book kind of evokes all the limitations of print versus online. Like, Jeff couldn't have done these notes as standalone print publication. He had to do them online. And in this case, collecting it means, you know, there's not only a huge selection of, of notes that weren't included, there's also the limitations of, of printing the images that he selected for those notes and and the comments and the interactions from his readers can't be there. Um, and those things are kind of integral to this, what I called a hybrid literary form before, uh, in terms of the notes. I don't know how you reconcile that by making it a, a print volume, which isn't to say that notebook doesn't deserve the praise Langdon gave it. It's a really impressive work. Like I said, it's, it's sort of like Facebook era Montaigne. Uh, Jeff is a fascinating person, original thinker, um, and to be honest, this era is filled with writers who have gone down the rabbit hole of introspection and basically come back with like navel lint and nothing else. Um, Jeff, Jeff's notes, they mine the, the terrain of his life and, you know, it's been 10 years and he keeps bringing back gold. So pick up Notebook from Princeton University Press, go to Facebook and search for Jeff Nunokawa. N-U-N-O-K-A-W-A, and check out his daily notes. He's reached his friend limit, so you can't add him that way. Um, but you can bookmark it, and you can still check out the notes and check out his, his timeline any old time. So um, it was a weird conversation, but a very fun one. He is all up and down the uh, kind of manic scale, as you'll tell. There's a lot of, if you look at the waveform for this episode, uh, there are chunks that are whispers and then suddenly maxed out in laughter. Um that's sort of how Jeff is, and uh, this is also an episode where he kind of gets me to talk a lot more, too. So you've been prepared. Otherwise, only caveat is it was New York City, so there's lots of, um, you know, general traffic noise. Now, here's Jeff's incredibly sparse bio from the flap copy of Notebook. Jeff Nunakawa teaches English literature at Princeton University and lives in Princeton and New York. And now... The Virtual Memories Conversation with Jeff Nunokawa. I'm not usually in this mood. Like, usually... Uh, uh, Sullen and dour. And <laughs> right, exactly. No, I'm usually not, like, so, like... You know, this, this uh, guy I knew, uh, uh, the best academic writer I knew personally, a guy called David Miller, once said that when you're really writing... You, um, it's it's instead of sex because you you have got to be constantly called to it, you know. Um, and in terms of uh, well, what sort of writing? Well, just any the type of writing. Or any writing I wonder with the, the, yeah. you know, the any, novelist versus the the nonfiction guys. Yeah, and, and, just any you know. writing that's you're really serious about. Yeah. 
Any writing that's really writing, mm-hmm. you know, that really matters to you. Where did writing start for you? When, does, when did writing start for me? It's, oh, interesting. All right, so it started when I was really young, um, and I was, and, uh, and I, I just have these memories of, for example, when I was, uh, when, I mo- when we moved to Hawaii and I was 11, 11 or 12 years old, and my mother, I remember uh, there was a moment where I just became obsessed with reading and more, even more obsessed with writing. And I, I wrote a paper when I was uh, young, um, t- uh, too young to write such a paper without it just being a, you know, cavalcade of cliches about French existentialism. And <clears throat> my mother, she uh, agreed to type the paper, and she just thought it was ridiculous because there were so few sentences. I mean, it was just all one long sentence and no commas. So cut to years later, after my first year at graduate school, um, I this was before... Uh, you know, computers. Well, before everyone had computers, and so I needed to. I asked my mother if she knew. Oh, well, the point is that uh, my mother had a friend who typed uh, for you know, like yeah. uh, as, uh, odd jobs for extra money, and so she said she got a hold of this person. She said to Pauline, she said, "Pauline, now I must warn you, my son is verbose." So feel free, please, to cut out excess verbiage and comma stick in commas. Yeah. So the the woman eventually returned the um, paper, and she, my mother comes up to me and she says, like, she, like I smell funny. She says, "You know, Pauline thinks you're brilliant." She's like laughing up her sleeve. <laughs> Little Pauline, does she know? Yeah, she, yeah. Pauline thinks you're brilliant. I said, "Pauline, my son is slightly above average. He's hardly brilliant." <laughs> Like Pauline was this idiot, so it began when I was young, but uh, it got really serious for me um, when I was in college, and then um, super serious, like life and death serious, when I was in graduate school, and even when I started being, when I started in as a professor, like I just felt like it was life and death. Like mm-hmm. um, I had this thing, and I couldn't control it. It's a little. It's a little bit like that great line in, um, which I'll bet you know, in um, The Postman Always Rings Twice. And the woman says, you know, when we were, t- like, sometimes when love is, when lovers are together, it's like airplanes, hmm. like two airplanes. But, and if we fly off together, but, but we weren't, we weren't like airplanes. We were like two Fords. And all these, <laughs> all this spirit just got into us. And it just, that just blows everything up. It just, we're just a couple of Fords. And so I felt somewhere between like being this airplane and being this car. And it was scary. Yeah. It was really scary. I, not only was I scared about getting fired from my job, I got, I was scared about getting fired from life, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, there's the first time that I went into therapy, and probably the last time that I did it seriously was having to deal with this problem. Yes, like, yeah, I do this instead. Yeah, no, I get that, and yeah, I love you know. that. I see that you do. <laughs> it I keeps me from having to, to really reveal anything about all that. What's the, interesting yeah. about you is that you're, yeah, good, interesting combination of like sincere and um, neurotic Jewish comedy, talkative. Yeah, 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 yeah funny, yeah. funny, <laughs> but wry. Yeah, but 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 talkative. Mm-hmm. It's, <clears throat> it's one of the great things throughout my career. That I've, I've been running by imposter syndrome all these years. Um, and whenever I tell somebody I'm a fraud, they, they laugh and chuckle about it and don't realize that they're actually empowering my ability to, to just keep the fraud and imposter it. going. I yeah, it, it's it. wonderful to, to pull off. But, um, huh. well, let me ask actually the, the initial question, which we'll yeah. get to the, uh, the weirdness. Do you feel special being the only person in the world who ever figured out how to use Facebook notes? Um, no, but I do. I'll tell you what. I I don't feel special, but I do feel. Um, Did you unlock an achievement like in a video game? Yes, I had a funny conversation actually with Facebook itself. A couple few years ago, they called me on the phone, and they said, um, "Well, we we want to make some changes to the note function." And um, you're the only guy who uses. Well, it, so. it's close. I, they said, "Since you're one of our power users," I said, "Oh, hold oh, oh, the phone! You mean I'm your only user? I'm, a, I'm one of your power users and one of your powerless users." So I didn't feel so much special, but I have felt like kind of like there's some, you know, it's a little bit like to compare large things to small. Um, Catherine Hepburn was once asked by. Um, uh, Dick Cavett, if she, how she felt about being always one of the most admired women in the world. And Catherine Hepburn said, 
I don't think people really admire me. They drive by. And they, it's like the Flatiron building. They drive by and they think, is that old thing still here? It's like, wait, did that dude still do that shit? I can't believe. So that's, I feel special that way. You mm-hmm. know, like special, not exactly the right word. Special, like someone like special school, special, you know, <laughs> exceptional, <laughs> exceptional, <laughs> exceptional. Yeah, I think so. Special thinker. Yeah. Trust me. I have the same with this. I mean, this yeah. is over 200 huh. episodes. I know, you know, nobody's listened to all 200 except for me. That's, that's, right. you know, I had to right. be there editing it and putting it out. Right. But otherwise, you know, um, although, I, I do think there's one or two people who've actually obsessively listened. The, actually, the more worrisome thing, and, and it happened earlier when I quoted one of your, your pieces to you or one of the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, citations. Um, do people cite posts of yours, notes of yours that you don't remember particularly well, and they act as though it's the most important thing to them um, and expect some, you to know it? In, sometimes, in that way? but what happens to me a lot, which is – and I just had a really hard time with this, and this is, this is going to sound – Fake, fake, fake in a way, but I, it, I, I flinch when people, uh, like, talk oh, I to read me. your work. It, yeah. yeah. Or when they, you know, when, uh, when the book came out, which, which is a source of great, uh, uh, unhappiness for me, that book, uh, for reasons I can't fully describe, but, um, we'll work it out. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. I can see that. I'm really glad. I love that. <laughs> Lanny was so right about you. But, um, that, um, that, um, um, I, I can't stand being, I mean, I love attention. Obviously, I wouldn't, do what I do. I love attention this kind of sub rosa way. I half love attention. Um, this kind of parallel universe of, um, but I hate, I actually, uh, I'm very, I uh, get embarrassed, um, when people, uh, write about my work or talk to me about it. I'm mm-hmm. just embarrassed. Um, like, uh, I don't know if it's imposter syndrome so much as like, okay, what would be the worst thing in the world to, to, to get what you think you've wanted? Mm-hmm. You know, like, and it just, oh, it was embarrassing to me. You know, so that's... Well, what you know. was the aim initially? Uh-huh. And, and the idea of building an audience is something that, that recurs yeah. throughout the, the theme of the show. Like, what was it like realizing that you had people Interesting. who cared? You know what? Honestly, when, it, when I first started doing it, well, a few things. I mean, and I'm not... You know, I mean, I don't know how to phrase this without either sounding kind of programmatic or too raw, but when I was kind of cycling out of New York... When I got to a point where I, you know, where I was the young man's game part in New York, I could no longer play. I was doing a lot of things I shouldn't be doing to stay up late at night. I'll just put it that way. And I, and I, you know, you emailed me at one thirty in the morning recently. Well, so. that, well, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, that's different. That's like, <laughs> that's like. But, yeah, but you know, like as somebody said to me, I get it. One of my, one of my, one of my best loved readers, a kid who graduated um, from Princeton in two thousand and four, he, he said to me, "I get it. It's your daily chip." Yeah. Um, it's like the AA meeting. It's yeah. like, it is the, it's the entitlement. It's the entitlement of sobriety, mm-hmm. that kind of writing. So partly it was that, but then partly it was like, I would get these notes from people when I was writing, you know, first writing before I, well, yeah, that's, I still get these notes, but I, it's, I, I, um, where people would say, you know, I was really feeling down and now I feel a little bit better. So thanks for that. Mm-hmm. That, that, that really gets you through mm-hmm. a lot. You know, that Did you ever take that the wrong way? Like, I thought my life was bad, but then I read yours. <laughs> <laughs> or was it more the support? And, and yeah, It was just, it wasn't even like, it, it, I don't know if it was so much identificatory, although there was a little bit of that, or even disidentificatory. It was just like, you know, it's like, you know, it's like this, the, the, when I grew up in Hawaii, there was this guy that would publish these daily columns, the Reverend Paul Osumi. And the Reverend Paul Osumi would write these daily columns, just today's thought. Mm-hmm. And my father would read them out loud because they were so banal. We would all laugh because they were so banal, mm-hmm. so stupid. And now, God, I thought, you know, I thought I wanted to be Theodore Adorno, and now I realize I really want to be the Reverend Paul Asumi, or some, you know, right? <laughs> or obviously some combination. But just that, that thought of like, I mean, there's nothing like that. That feeling of like, all these people out there, and I know, you know, um, most of these people would be disappointed if they actually ever met me. But, but I, I like feeling that you know, when I get up in the morning, um, that, that's, that that's true. And it's especially been true lately, like this one friend of mine, this kid, a um, very smart kid, smart in the head kid, and he says, oh, you're consolatory drivel, all that consolatory drivel. And as somebody said to me, yeah, he's young. He doesn't know the need for consolation. But now especially with what's going on in the world, I mean, same kid said, wow, now your readers are really going to need you. But yeah. you know, it's a little bit like the way that somebody said, uh, a friend of mine, 
walking, was walking by one of the AA meeting houses, and he said, after 9-11, he said, wow, the drunks are really going nuts now. And I'm here for that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I feel like. It's like, we were talking about earlier about like what we do at this moment, and I sort of feel like, well, I don't know what I can do exactly, but I know one thing I can do inexactly, and that is to address people who are feeling even worse because of this shit. You know what I mean? I've I've been afraid to go back to your shortly after the election post because once we scheduled this, I was sort of going back and reading from Mm -hmm. the the present backwards. Um, In my case, it was the day after the election. I was walking my dog around the block and had the why do I bother doing this? You know, it's a fallen world. Hour-long conversations about culture and books are not meant for this this planet. Not that I was acting from any sense of privilege, but um, mm-hmm. during the walk, I remembered the very finished two uh, Invisible Cities by Calvino mm-hmm. with the um, the two alternatives. One is to just, you know, accept that you're in hell, or the Inferno. The other is to, in the middle of Inferno, find the things that are not Inferno and give them space and let them grow. Um, and I figured in my self-important way, that was, you know, as good as that's going to get. I will do my best to, you know, keep this going. If it is consolation for someone, you know, that's, that's great. great. If it's consolation great. just for me, that's, you know, a little pricey. But, you know, that's why I have a job, you know, as that's a whore. Beautiful. So, um. <laughs> that's beautiful. It makes me think of something amazing that a friend of mine in college said. We were talking about something terrible and something terrible late at night, really terrible, awful, you know, some version of hell and um, historical hell. And she said, God, Jeff, whenever we get, whenever that we get, start talking late enough, and it's late enough, you just, you suddenly we're just right there in the inferno. Always we get there. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, <laughs> that seems, that sounds very harsh to me. She said, Jeff, I, I didn't say I wasn't there with you. Yeah. That's the thing. We need the, the, yeah. the community, I yeah. guess. Yeah. How did it evolve? Uh uh-huh. So, so that's a really good question. So, and it's, how did you evolve in the process? Yeah. So it, it, you know, it's, it, it, sometimes it feels to me just a little bit like, you know, like how you, you, you get a dog and it's not really your dog. It's somebody else's dog, but you're taking care of it. Maybe it's your mother's dog. It's somebody's dog. And suddenly you have that dog and one way or another, that dog becomes the center of your life. Mm-hmm. And so this thing, this project, which began as a lark, and I was so silly before, it just began as a joke. Um, it's become the single most serious thing in my life. And mm-hmm. so the writing, I mean, you know, it may not be obvious, but it's, I'm really careful about it now. And it's like, I've tried to, the, the main way it's changed is like, I feel like it's less Gerard Manley Hopkins, more E.B. White. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to be plainer, a lot plainer. Um, I'm trying not to be precious or fussy. I'm trying to be just as straightforward as I can be. I'm trying to be, you know, just less fancy, more handy. How long do posts um, gestate for you? Do, do you tend to post serially, or do you have ones that you've been thinking about oh, for a, a while and are, are sort of in the inventory? It's a really good question, and it's a source of considerable um, vexation for me right now because it's distinctly, um, um, mostly, it's 90% on the spot. Mm-hmm. It's 90%. Immediate. Exactly. Now, the reason why I say it's a source of some vexation for me is that I want to publish another book, and um, I don't know exactly what the book is going to look like. Probably, um, my guess is it'll just be what I think of as a better version of, of, uh, you know, a better selection, because I feel like my writing's improved. Um, But I have other ideas, and, you know, I feel like probably they would be... And so I have an idea about various books and so i will um for example a book about uh well you you would get this a little bit i think my uh, you were just in demand today everybody's yeah. calling you that's it's the same person it, doubtless <laughs> yeah, is the same. Yeah. um but i'll um so it's a, it's a book about how the way that um I, that I and a lot of people were brought up by sort of mid-century middle brow middle class mixed feeling kind of melting pot liberals so mm-hmm. my father was asian my mother was was white and um but just that sense not so much a memoir as a kind of not you know like a impersonal memoir being raised by new deal great society democrats of a certain moment where what mattered what was most personal what, what was most uh, instructive infectious intimate about the way they trained us was 
that it wasn't personal, that it was not just about us, our identity, ourselves. So that's like a big thing in my mind, and it's my my mother has become like the central figure in the writing mm-hmm. because of this. So to go back to your question, I guess I believe it or not, is the question. I dream of things to write about, and then I wake up and I have these things dreamed of. It used to be that it was entirely uh, spun, uh, sort of. I would look for text that would somehow uh, reflect back and light up what I was feeling. Now I'm more aware at times. There's a, like a push pull. So not ninety percent, more like seventy percent. Hmm. Um, but it's a problem because how will I ever get a book? I don't know, you know. But I can't think about that too much, you know. What I what I don't do is stockpile. I don't stockpile entries. Like it has to be a little bit like this conversation. Yeah, yeah that's what I'd wonder. Do you have things that were ideas and thoughts, and yeah, I should work on that. I shouldn't publish this right away because it needs more work. Let me sit down and. Uh, you I can't know. do that. Yeah, I can't do that. I can't hmm. do that. Not with this. Not not to keep the fe- the the. The, the, I understand the, the immediacy of what it is. And the joy. Yeah. The yeah. joy. I mean, the, the actual, this friend of mine used to say to me, you know, Jeff, you've done one thing that's really important. He doesn't speak to me anymore, this friend of mine, but he said this very beautiful thing, very kind thing, which is you have converted writing into a source of pleasure. And that's very, very lucky. Mm-hmm. And it's true. So for it, to, I have to keep doing this. How does your mom feel about being a character? She feels, um, I think, to be really honest. That's why we're here. Yeah. I think it actually is a source of great comfort for her and great mm. joy. Um, and I, she would never say that to me. Yeah. But she's a lonely woman. I mean, she's not lonely in the sense of like pathetic. I mean, she's got lots of friends. But, you know, she's 87 and she's very willful. And the world that she grew up with is gone now. Um, uh, most of her friends are gone now. and But most importantly, just that world she grew up with is gone now. And to have it reproduced... So it's a little bit like the Betty Crocker cookbook, mm-hmm. you know, to have it, to have it pre- reproduced as without, with some edits, you know, uh, with some edits. I think she's very comforted by that. Does yeah. she object to your characterizations of her at times? Oh, she'll always say you take liberties with the truth, but she enjoys yeah. saying that. That's what yeah. Does she legit object or just the, the mom stuff? That, no, no. Uh, it's, I mean, okay. but we, we've actually, we, we frequently talk about this and she'll agree with this. I know she will. She, um, she does. I'll, she'll. We'll, we have the same as with most mothers. We have the same, you know, dispute. Um, and she'll say, and I'll say, but well, mom, admit it. I've gotten the essence right. Yeah. She say, well, that's true. But that's not exactly what I said. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or she'll just say that it was so and so outside of yeah. this town, and so and so, and you put those two stories together. But I said, but I got the essence. Yeah. And she said, yeah. I just did one last weekend with uh, uh, Philip Lopez oh, uh, over in yeah, Brooklyn, yeah. and he just has a new book out that is him returning to audio interviews he recorded with his mother in 1984. Wow. He sat on them for over 30 years before wow. he still doesn't know why, listening to them again. He he went. He had to go buy a cassette player so that he could actually start playing these and, and yeah. you know, listen. Wow. And then start assessing not just – what the conversation between 40, 41 year old Philip and 60 something mom was, but listening to it from, you know, the 70 the something perspective that he's in now um, and, and trying to assess. So it's partly transcription, but also his uh, shaping it plus, you know, his own current day uh, explication, exposition uh, around what's there. What a good there. friend for you. How great to yeah. have that. I mean, oh, it, it's it's it was one of those things. I interviewed him a few years ago and thought yeah. he had no recollection of this whatsoever. But yeah. it turned out, um, you know, he remembered and and has invited me to a Mets game at some point How next cool spring after this. So I figured, How you know, Elizabeth Bishop, Marianne Moore, yeah, yeah, they had that whole uh, date. Yeah. yeah, well, that was yeah. part of reading the the guy who connected us, Langdon Hammer, yeah. um, reading his biography of James Merrill and seeing that. Um, the friendship among artists. I, I still consider myself to be uh, uh, just some schlub from New Jersey. So, you know, just just some weird hanger on a <laughs> really? parasite. But, you know. We all do. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I don't belong here. This is yeah, fine. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but let me ask you, you've already brought up why you hate, well, that you hate the book, the notebook, yeah, yeah, yeah. or a notebook that was a, a collection of your stuff. What do you hate about it? And what was the it's process too, like? Well, you know, honestly, um, there, in some day, I'd actually like to talk to this person. There were a lot of reviews of the book, more than mm-hmm. I've ever gotten. And I shouldn't say a lot, not like Lang. I mean, it wasn't that kind of book. But but it was reviewed pretty widely. And the review that has stayed with me most most deeply was the one profoundly nasty review I got. <laughs> and it was written by um, 
it was in the Wall Street Journal, and it was clearly something this person had, and, and it was, and he came at me with with all with you know with both barrels and the self absorption the, yeah, the exactly. Facebook culture. Oh, the title was the title was brilliant. It was the other selfie, and it was <laughs> and it was extremely intelligent. It was it was just. It was at least half right. Mm. It was devastating. It was entirely unsympathetic. And, the, um, um, but it stayed with me, um, um, uh, in a way that a, an intelligent, and I'm going to go ahead and use the word nasty, uh, re- review. It wasn't, it was in fact nasty. And, and I don't use this. Oh, in fact, I'm not going to go there. But, but, he, everything, it's as if nothing that was good about the book was noticed and all that was bad about the book. Mm-hmm. In other words, in my most, in my darkest superego moment, I couldn't have written a better review. Yeah, that it was right. everything you hate about Kate your own stuff too. sincerity, <laughs> this, that, I mean, it just went on and on. But just even what I was asking you right there about what did that sound magnanimous. Yeah. Um, but that man did me an awful, an awful service. And he, and he helped me. Um, and if there were ever an occasion, um, this side of heaven, uh, for me to thank him, I, I would. Um, well, because. Give me his name after. I'll see if I can get him on the show. Oh, <laughs> Jeremy Axelrod. I'll never forget. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't know who he is. Um, and, and, you know, there's lots of ways of dismissing the review, but I don't want to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not interested. In fact, you, I was, you were politically correct about the review. If you want to read it carefully and the references to Oscar Wilde and this, that, and this, you, know, you could put together that it'd be easy enough to arraign him mm-hmm. uh, for his homophobia, etc. But I don't want to because it was a just review mm-hmm. and it's taken me very far. Mm-hmm. It's taken me very far away from the person who wrote that. Yeah, how has that changed? How have you I just changed? feel like... Besides I, the, the I, simplifying and stripping yeah, down. Yeah, I just feel like I'm a little less... I'm a little less intent on sounding magnanimous Mm -hmm. in sounding a little bit weirdly enough. I'm not going to deny that this book's about me, um, that the writing is about me, but I just feel a little bit less busy about, um, um, being self-aware and aware of like, you know, I don't know. I I try to, I feel, and I could be wrong, uh, I feel like the writing is better and it's a little bit less narcissistic. Now, that said, I am very mindful of this great, you know, this was this great thing that uh, one of uh, one of Nabokov's biographers says. Um, he says that he co- brings this, and obviously I'm really not comparing myself to Nabokov. I didn't have his good luck. Um, um, uh, but uh, Nabokov uh, brings something to, that he's written, maybe Pale Fire even, and it says uh, that this is the best thing he's ever written. But this biographer says, but of course, every writer thinks about that. Yeah. But you know what? I'm okay with that. Yeah. You know, with, I mean, what, I mean, you know, as a colleague said to me once, a colleague who'd never really liked me very much, but, and I don't know if you like this book, but he saw that I was really in, in serious about writing. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, Jeff, you get to an age, you gotta stop the smoking. You gotta stop the, you know, the chasing of women. You gotta stop the drinking. You've even gotta stop the coffee, but you never have to stop the writing. You can always, it means you could always try yeah. to get better. Mm-hmm. Let me ask about Pale Fire. Yeah. You mentioned in one of the, the entries that's collected in the book that that mm-hmm. was the um, sort of the impetus for this project, this sort of oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, semi-fictional yeah, totally, commentary totally, totally, on, totally, on you know, totally, an artwork yeah, that doesn't exactly yeah, exist. Yeah. How much is the Jeff of the Notes a novelistic uh-huh. self for you? How that's much does it diverge question. from from you know, Jeff as Jeff? That's such a good question. I think... Um, well, these are all cliche questions. Well, you, you don't have to humor me. It's no, no, okay. no, no. It's actually... I mean, for me... Well, that may be a cliche question, but it's one that hits home for me right now. Um, you know what? I would have said before um, that I really knew the answer really well, mm-hmm. um, that there was a really bright line, um, that it was a certain version of myself that I was activating and trying to broadcast. It was a sort of campy, you know, yeah. uh, academic gay Jeff, um, a thin Jeff, um, a, a, you know, a parlor trick Jeff. Um, like you mentioned, you ask about, uh, Hailfire, like, uh, a, a friend of mine, a colleague, a guy I really respect a lot. And you'll see why from this one comment. 
um, he said to me, he, uh, a very strict Catholic and a strange guy, P. Adam Sidney, but we were talking once about pale fire. And I was saying, and I produced my usual line about pale fire, about how, you know, it had done for homophobia what Empson said Christianity did for, excuse me, uh, Milton had done for Christianity, which is to produce the most, the most artistic defense of an untenable ideology. <laughs> Yeah. That's just a usual line. I'm just one of my little laugh lines. But uh, P. Adams said, that's not true. It's not actually true about Pale Fire, that the, that the character is just too thin and campy and over the top to be anything other than an obvious charade. So I feel like, it, at the very least, so this is a real answer. I'm just, this is real. I'm not making this, this is not canned. This is something I'm just thinking out loud now. I should have you as a therapist. Um, <laughs> whatever I'm doing yeah. now, it's not, it's, it's not to me an obvious charade. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Jeff of those notes is an, more, more of an obvious charade. Mm-hmm. A lot of that. Was there a particular breakthrough moment? Yeah. Or a moment that you noticed that this had converged? Um, no. I just, mm-hmm. I feel like, um, you know, I, yeah, uh-huh. I'll put it this way. I, I, I write less directly now about what I'm immediately feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, and weirdly enough, I think that gets me to better places. Now, I, uh, so even though it sounds like me, 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 it's actually much less me, 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 me in some kind of direct way than it was when I was writing those. And to put it in, just to add something else here, I am constantly bothered by what, uh, uh, by by um, something about these things, which is about what I write, uh, it, which is the absence of an object. In other words, I have an object, but it's oblique. Whereas when I'm doing you know strict academic criticism, there is an object. Yeah. So there's a structural modesty, right? You're writing about something outside yourself. Mm-hmm. Now, I know it's not obvious, but I'm much more I'm much more mindful of an object outside myself, even though most of my sentences have the word I in them. The empty pedestal. Yeah. 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 I mean it, it puts me in mind it's something I talked about with Lopate years ago, um, the first time we spoke. The empty Montaigne's essays which start off in the three, four, five page, you know, focused mm-hmm. on a particular topic, and by the time you get to the third book, these things thirty, forty, fifty pages and whatever the title is, is not what he's writing about. Um, that that you know, the form starts to expand and allow him to encompass the self as uh-huh. opposed to a thing you know that he's he's ostensibly his his original you know idea of of a topic is all of a sudden subsumed by this you know outflow of himself. Ha! Huh, interesting. Yeah. And yet at the same time, your your posts are getting shorter and shorter uh, in in some ways and, and getting much more incisive. I'm trying. I think what I'm trying to do maybe. S- Something like the opposite. Like, yeah. I, I, I am trying. And I don't know. You know, I, we'll, we'll, we'll see what, what uh, the way that 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 guy who wrote the Wall Street Journal review um, ended the thing it was a devastating and brilliant before a moment. He said, "So at the end, you know, this guy's obviously read a lot, blah blah blah. But in the end, it's just like those selfies that people take in front of the uh, all the great monuments." Mm-hmm. And all you see is them. Yeah. And I think the biggest challenge, and you know, who knows? I, can't, I won't be the judge of this. Is whether or not I've become a more transparent, in a good sense, self. Mm. That's the biggest question. Yeah, I don't know. You know, there's no way of knowing for me to know that. Like mm. I'm trying to become not smaller, but more. Uh, Something you through whom you see something else. Yeah, you know, like yeah. Do you get a tone of that from the from the notes from the comments that you get through the the posts on Facebook? And have those evolved as people have grown more accustomed to using that medium? That's such a good question, Gil. That's such a good question. And my whole thing is the the virtual life and the the IRL huh. thing and how we balance those. Uh, again, like people who think they know me from listening to these things. Only lately in the last, well, post-election and then post my dog dying a month later, I've really cut down my Facebook use to, to almost zero. Um, I check in to see notifications. 
Oh, uh, he was with us almost nine years. Oh, I'm so um, sorry. It's, it's, you know, we gave him a good life. Um, yeah. But it was just one of those after that, I thought, I'm not really interested in sharing uh-huh. anymore. Uh-huh. And I can't keep up with everybody's feeds yeah. anymore. And if I just cut this out, all of a sudden, there were just hours extra in a day. The only things I, I log into now are to check your notes and um, the, the the Greyhound Friends Adoption Group in New Jersey because there's always nice stories about other people's dogs and, and this one three-legged dog in particular who I like to keep up with. Uh, but I don't comment. I don't like. I don't do anything anymore. And it's only been a month or two. I didn't make any statement about it because that's one of the most uh, stupid things you can do is to announce that you're leaving the party. I understand. Uh, because... You're just trying to draw attention to the fact that you don't want the attention anymore, and that's just an ego trick. So um, it's one of those things Great phrase, where, ego trick, by the way. Great yeah, phrase. yeah, it's yeah. one of those, oh, no, no, I'm not really doing this. Oh, but in no. fact, I want you all to pay attention to me. But I just like that phrase, ego trick versus yeah. ego trip. Is it yeah, yeah, it is, it's a little sweet, yeah. different. I go on now, I, all I post about is the show Anything, you know, relating to a new episode being up. And if I post a picture, I've only started using Instagram very recently and I enjoy it because there's just an image and I try and make the most oblique, you know, obscure reference possible with as few words as I can. And that mm-hmm. just cross posts to a couple right, of right, media. Right, right, right. Um, so but yeah, seeing the, um, this current, you know, uh, uh, withdrawal that I'm engaged in just kind of disengaging from this stuff, um, and seeing the few good uses of it, like what you're doing. Um, I'm curious in general about, you know, what those networking things are doing to the ways we interact with one another, which is why whenever anybody asks me, can we do the interview by Skype? I say no, we can't. No, right, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's Brad Gooch, actually, who lives a few... Oh, or, I know Brad. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the two gay men who are looking far, far younger than, than they should, <laughs> uh, <laughs> who I've met Brad, through the show. Brad, um yeah. He quoted a, a Frank O'Hara line uh, to me, which is the only truth comes face to face. And uh, that's pretty much why I do this the way I do this. It's funny. To, that's know. true about you. I think it's not true about a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. I wonder what is wrong yeah. with me, that, that this is how I see stuff. And so. what is right with you. Yeah, well, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the the social media aspect of this versus the in real life thing mm-hmm. for you, how is that – what is it like meeting someone who you've only known through? Those I've never media? done it. Yeah, well, now I've you never have, done but, it. You know. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've never done it, and um, and yeah, but I'll, I'll t- you know, I want to circle back to one thing that you asked before because I'll tell you, and I think this is connected to your question. I used to be a big telephone person, mm-hmm. um, and then as as life evolves, um, there are large times where I'm not inclined to talk, and we're talking without being with someone, and I'm often not with someone. Right. Um, it was like I was caught between time zones, and so I wanted to have this conversation, put something out there, and um, there was no one to talk to. Um, and so the question about comments was, to be really honest, any comment at all, I'm extremely grateful for. Sure. And people, I can tell, take a lot of trouble sometimes to respond to what, I, to what I've written. And other times they respond just very quickly. Both things I find extremely, I'm very grateful for. Um, so have the comments changed? Only, only in the sense that I am much more mindful of how much they mean to me. Yeah. So I don't know if they've changed. Yeah, so I wonder if people are writing differently or if they're too harried nowadays and it's much more it, yeah. you know proportionally there's more just quick you know yeah. thanks for this comments as opposed to you know yeah more thought out or, yeah. or longer form ones. yeah 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 because um, yeah it's it's we're all in our cocoons yeah. in in the cocoon i'm in everybody seems very very harried at this point right. and and ha- doesn't have time that said your part of your audience is your students i assume right. yeah, um, yeah and they might have a different set of of they might think they're busy now but they don't really understand how busy they're going to be once they're they're out in the real world because their busyness is scheduled yeah in a way yeah. that if when we're busy partly it's that we realize that our busyness exceeds any schedule that we can write down yeah. Or any ability for us to finish Precisely. everything we have yeah. to do. Yeah. So, how's teaching? You've been in the same institution for yeah. twenty five since nineteen eighty eight. 
88. Yeah. Shit, I thought it was like early 90s. Yeah, okay, so almost yeah. 30 years of Princeton. Yeah. How has the institution changed? How have the students changed? And how has your teaching approach changed? So how has the institution changed? Or have there been? Oh, there you know, have been huge changes. That you can talk about without getting in trouble. So what are the three questions? How the institution uh, institutions, changed? Institution, students, students, and your own teaching style. My own teaching. Okay, good. I can answer. Let me do it in... Yeah, but, whichever one, yeah, yeah, whichever yeah, sequence makes sense to you. Institution, let's put it this way. I, and I really mean this, and I really meant this when I, I can't imagine that when I started teaching at Princeton, I would ever write um, to the president, who was someone who, you know, yeah, the, to the president, Chris Eisgruber, who drafted a letter um, calling upon the president to rescind or reform, rectify, I think was his word, the immigration order, I never thought I would write to the president of my university the following note. Um, Thanks for this, Chris. I can't tell you how proud I am that you're my president. Mm -hmm. And that he would respond, "Um, thanks, Jeff, Uh, uh, good news from Seattle last night. So, Chris, act, Chris. Um, I never imagined that. that. I never imagined that in certain matters I would think of the president as far more liberal than I am, Mm -hmm. you know. I never imagined. So partly it's changed. I've changed. In in good ways, all in good ways, you know. Um, I am now the the fuddy-duddy old guard. (laughs) So, okay, this is this. So then how has the teaching changed and how have my students changed? Was that the the other two questions? Okay, yeah, yeah. So my teaching, I'm not nearly as good a teacher as I used to be. How so? Um, My uh, my lectures, um, I think... Are I mean, I'm a different kind of teacher. I feel like, and I'm going to now. I will say this. Um, this is now. This is a praxis formulation, but I think it's one I will stand by. Um, it used to be that when I taught and when I wrote and when I taught, but, but you know, both, both, that I felt absolutely imperative. That I felt it necessary. Um, I felt it imperative that I produce in that lecture some insight about the text which no one had ever thought before, mm-hmm. yeah. that no one had ever come up with before. Now I'm much more inclined when I teach to be interested in teaching things that I think everybody knows but are in danger of forgetting. That's what I think. That's my main thing. So I feel like my lectures are far more... I mean, they're still very fancy yeah. in certain ways, but... But the goal is more reminding, uh, or, or at least evoking something in. in yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. You know, I'll give you an example. Like I was teaching Vanity Fair, not a couple of years ago, I guess, and I was I have a, I had a very you know, I'm very smart in the head reading of the. I, that's a phrase that I remember from when I was a graduate school, and one of the one of my one of my friends had written a dissertation. Oh no, it was even uh, yeah. Uh, somebody was trying to get a book published, and this person whom I happen to know, had written this very negative review of the, of the manuscript and said, so-and-so is very smart in the head. And at the time, I just thought, well, isn't that a nasty, rude thing to say? Um, but I understand what she means now, although she was very ungenerous in the way that she said it. But, but um, So they're very smart in the head. Like, you know, the smart in the head lecture about Bourdieu and symbolic and physical capital, blah, blah, blah. But it had to do with this moment in the novel where a kid, a guy, goes to Waterloo, and before he goes, he writes this letter to his father, and um, this, but it's in the British style, and so there's no emotion that can be detected in the letter, although it was very emotional. And so blah, 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 blah. And then he dies, of course, a while ago. Um, his face, face down in a ditch, a bullet through his heart. And um, um, I said, you know, kids, if you don't remember anything else I ever say to you, just remember this. Make sure that you, as much as possible, in whatever the last, whatever conversation you're having with your parents, make sure that you make things as good as they can be, mm-hmm. as repair as much as you can, because it may be the last time you talk to them. Mm-hmm. That's that's. So was that a good lecture? I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, twenty years ago, I could, I felt like I could have put any anything I said up against any of the scientists, and it would be just as rigorous. Yeah, I don't know anymore. I've gotten leaky at it. You know? Is it simply a function of the, the decades there? Or are the students in any way hmm. um, looking for something different than you used question. to question Interesting question. I don't think so. I don't hmm. think this. I mean, I love my students and I know them really well because I'm you know, the head of a college too and I live with them. Um, 
I don't think they've changed that much. Okay. I think young people are young people. I think, you know, the same things that were said that were said that's been said about them, about the millennial, was said about us. Yeah. Uh, the same thing. Well, you and I are different generations, yeah. sadly. Um. Yeah, but I'll bet you it's the same things. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, same thing about me. That you know, this, I remember this, you know, the whole yuppie thing and how superficial and careerist we were, and blah blah blah. Same thing, but they're the same. Mm-hmm. They don't read as much. They can't read as well because of all the new. You know, I think long form is increasingly difficult for them, etc. That said, they're you know, in the same ways as absolutely cynical and as absolutely credulous and and, and hungry to believe as we ever were. Mm-hmm. Both those things. You know, as, as worldly and parochial as, as you know, as overfed and hungry as all the things we were. All and of them. Just the the magic of being under twenty five years old. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God, yeah. yeah. Middle March or Bleak House? Middle March. I assumed, but you know, figured. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know. Odyssey or Iliad? I know it's not Odyssey, your 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 Odyssey, Odyssey. really. Odyssey. I, I I came to the Iliad. I, um, I came down on the side of the Iliad huh. just a few years Why? ago. I'm curious. Because I finally saw Achilles as a person. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. I, I finally got that he has a child back home. I finally got that he has a father. It was my fourth reading when I was around 40 or so. Um, and the most important thing was I finally realized he's the only one who can see the strings. Hmm. Uh, it's in book nine where, where he basically goes on about the the fate that he knows is waiting for him. And no one else in the room, it's almost as though they have not heard him. Like they don't understand anything that he just said because he's the only one who understands fate and the rest of them are, are wandering around in the fog. And that was sadder for me than Odysseus and the, the wonders of, of the trip, largely because I also reached the conclusion that Odysseus may have made up everything and accidentally killed his entire crew uh, because all the wonderful stories are all things that he's telling people. None of them are sort of outside of his narrative framework. Um, so it's possible Odysseus is history's first serial killer. These are just things that occur to me when I don't have academia behind me and can just sit yeah, around reading in my library at home. There's a lot behind you, <laughs> in you. That's so great. Two thoughts come to mind. One is I, I love the Iliad, and I love the Iliad that, you know, that, that has been bequeathed by um, uh, Simone Weil and uh, Jasper Griffith. I mean, the, mm-hmm. and they're very similar um, Iliads. Um, that great moment that Jasper Griffith talks about, where he talks about where Odysseus, excuse me, where uh, Achilles is about to kill someone and the, and the person begs for life. And Achilles stops and looks at him almost in wonder, partly in contempt, but mostly in wonder. He says, I am half God and I have to die. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. His understanding that he's mortal, everybody else gets it, but even when you see him in the, in the afterlife, mm-hmm. uh, in, in the Odyssey, when he's, still this bitter shade even after the after death it's it's anyway it took me multiple readings to get to a point of not thinking achilles is just some entitled douchebag you know monster um and yeah. when i did it was finally this this unfolding of yeah. what you say about about odysseus though makes me think that maybe the reason why i prefer it is uh, reflects a defect of my character oh no everybody is, loves odysseus no more. no no it, it's okay i'm a liar I lie a yeah. lot, and yeah. that's how he got goes through. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean I – well, yeah, I lie yeah. a lot. I mean, when I was younger and I was anxious about people uh, 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 somehow destroying me or hurting me, exacting vengeance, I would always say to myself right before I go to sleep, I can always lie. Mm-hmm. When I say I'm a liar, what I mean is I, 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 I lie a lot to escape things. Or I imagine that I can lie to escape things, and yeah. that's what Odysseus does. That's you see, I'm incapable of that. I am, I, huh. my, my wife knows I'm so ridiculously honest that, you know, I just can't hide something. Are you for real? You're so interesting. Oh, you have to have a, you have to have a, you have to have a, a twin who's a therapist and another <laughs> who I could be boyfriends with. You're amazing. Well, I'll do therapy. I actually joked, I had one about a year ago oh. that is a wonderful cartoonist. Um, and it it turned into a therapy. So I joked that I was going to charge her seventy five dollars. We had to like end it at fifty minutes. I joked and and charge her seventy five bucks. Yeah. Um, seventy five would be cheap. No, no. We subsequently well, this is out in Kentucky, so you know I figured maybe <laughs> it's a cheaper rates out there. No, we uh, we stayed close ever since. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, there's a degree that you know I always tell people I'm not really interesting. What's interesting is the microphones and the two people talking and what comes out of that. Um, a very therapeutic thing to say. I try. Right? You know, <laughs> I guess my, my, my right Jewish history. So, you know. called, I think they call it the transference. Yeah. Well, let me ask, um, doing 
these notes, writing the way you did, particularly on social media, mm-hmm. were there problems with that when you started at Princeton? You know, it's funny you ask that. I, I, th- I have a past head- guest who says he got fired from his university job because he refused to stop blogging. But that's that's what I wonder. Oh, interesting. You know, I, I, had, had in it never been raised? In my head, there were, but never. I mean, you know, one of the grand things about one of the great things about great institutions like that is that they can afford to. I mean, I think I'm a curio. I'm a yeah. curiosity. I, but. And at this point, to be honest with you, Gil, I'm very aware of the enormous luxury of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Are people laughing up their sleeves? Are they thinking, God, has he lost his mind? Or, my God, he really went over the edge? But there was never a departmental, Oh, you no. Know, and moreover... Jeff, to rein this in. Exactly. Nothing. Moreover, one of the great fortunes of my life is that I have a job where I can even stop caring about that. Mm-hmm. I mean... I, I'm the, you know, I, I can't believe my good fortune sometimes, but yeah. that's, that's, if I, you know, like, if I were to try, to try to kind of like produce an inventory of what constitutes this fortune, part of it would be even I, who's so over, looking over his shoulder, so neurotic, so weak about peer pressure, um, about pressure, social pressure, even I have stopped worrying about that. You know, and and that's I just I just will you know. Is that essentially the job security side or the um, the age we live in, where people put out so much more of who they are? Good question. Um, a little of both, but I mm-hmm. think it's also, frankly, just the age. Like yeah. you get to a point where, like, okay, amongst the following things, what worries me the most mm-hmm. that people are la- that I'm a laughing stock. In in uh, in the in my at my home institution or more broadly in the in the world of literary critics, a b. How I will endure my mother's death. I choose b. Sure, right. It's like and that's so much bigger a thing every day. Mm-hmm. It's like how am I going to do that? And you, you know, like and you know what, what everything b stands for. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. really. Really? What do I, you know, or, or frankly, just to bring it a little bit less, make it a little less grand, A, all that business about uh, what people think of what I do, B, what I see when I look in the mirror, which is just defeat after defeat, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, you know, that's vanity and beyond vanity, it's mortality, it's like, oh God. But you no. stay in good shape. I said, well, I work out a lot, but it's like, you know, there's no, there's no amount of stairmaster that's going to bring me all the way to heaven. <laughs> that's a, there's only one guest on the show uh, in the show's history who's died. So, you know, and he was he was dying when <laughs> I recorded Hora. with him. So, you know, we, I felt pretty good about it because yeah. I've even interviewed a guy in his 90s who's still rolling along two years later, um, and the only one who died was you know stage four at that point anyway when we recorded our thing. God, Lang was so right about you. <laughs> So funny. I shudder to ask. You know, the funny thing with Langdon that I didn't know because I didn't do enough research beforehand, I just figured between the person who connected me with him and the subject of of his book being James Merrill, Mm -hmm. um, I just assumed he was gay. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and discovered, oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. I made a completely wrong set of assumptions Hilarious. going into this meeting. Exactly. It's funny because I'll tell you something. When my mother came to college, when she came to my college graduation, she met Lanny. She met a whole bunch of other people. And when I finally got around to telling her years later that I was gay – um, she, she, and we were talking about friends of mine at college who were gay, and she, and she said, "That one friend of yours I know was." Yeah, and of course he's the one friend who wasn't. <laughs> also, straight and gay uh, men and women would just praise, you know, uh, that the Lenny was, you know, Adonis uh, back oh. when. Yeah, oh you my guys god, were all in college. the girls would line up yeah. around. Oh my god, there'd be <laughs> lines and lines and lines. Oh my god, it was crazy, crazy. It was crazy. Oh my god, it was crazy. <laughs> but you know. I, I, you know, a lot of those girls I know, but I will say he, he, he was extreme. My phrases without sounding t- sort of tacky. He never made you feel shitty for for being into him. Yeah. He didn't like cultivate it, right. but he didn't. But there was never an insult of you know. It was never a sense yeah, exactly. Yeah, there was yeah. never a sense in any way, and that's yeah. a gift. Mm-hmm. I have a one young friend, a former. I mean, a, a kid uh, whom I'm so proud of because he's got this. He's gorgeous, like Lang. But that sense that – here's what he said to me, this kid. Such a good comment. We were out in the streets. Uh, we were – he's a super straight guy. 
Although he has got to come this whatever, you know, nowadays there are nobody's super anything. But he, some, some guy was coming on to him. Some very good looking guy, you know, your age, not my age. And he was like really pl- making a play for this kid. And I was, I was, I was feeling, I don't know, sort of not super bad, but a little bit marginalized. And he said to me later, Jeff, whatever we were, whatever we were, uh, was happening, whatever we were, was happening there in the street there or at that cafe, we were going through it together. And that sense mm-hmm. of like camaraderie, which isn't interrupted, by that, those feelings of desire, that's a gift. That's a gift from God. Mm-hmm. You know. How old were you when he came out? Huh. To well, your family and then to my family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those two different things. Such you know, question. in your personal life so, and then to my your... mother. I came when I as I got to college. Oh, to everyone around me, but so late seventies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, barely late seventies, nineteen seventy-six. But I didn't. I told my mother years later, and I didn't tell my father until I had tenure. I just wouldn't have done it. You know, I really wouldn't have. Um, hmm. I, my, that was, he was old school and he didn't say a thing about it until the following year. And he came and he said, you know, Jeff, cause I, I, I took, I saw that he took it under advisement and it went into the kind of central, I have to process this exactly yeah. of his mind, a very old school person. And, um, he said, he came out a year later and he said, you know, Jeff, I've been thinking about the whole, about you. And I realized I made one mistake with you bringing you up. And that is, I saw signs of that when you were a kid. And I thought my job was to extirpate that, was to extirpate that, was to remove that. But I was wrong. I was, I was trying to turn you into a samurai and you were actually a poet. I went the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And my father's never apologized to me for anything. But yeah. that, was, that was as close as he came. Mm. Yeah. Were you reconciled about oh, quite. everything? He, my father did a great deal of, of work to, it was, a, it, was a, it was a terrifically difficult man, very harsh, Oh, very brilliant, but he did a terrific amount of work toward the end of his life, the last 15 or 20 years of his life, to to make us friends. Mm-hmm. And he did. How did your parents meet? It does seem a little weird. Right. Uh, he's Japanese? He's Japanese. And, and she was from oh, eastern so Washington. And I've, I've got friends in Spokane. It oh, is, really? It is not the most cosmopolitan area by any means. Oh. Uh, actually, my best friend there is uh, half black, half Japanese, and has no oh. idea how his parents met. So oh, I wow. figured you might yeah. at least have some, some story. That so, yeah. But, yeah, just to give you a sense of what, of what the background she was from, she, my mother, um, when she was a kid, she was not only with, I mean, stipulate uh, any colored people of any kind, stipulate Jews, stipulate most or whatever, but she was warned even against Mediterranean types. Yeah. And she says, if she had, if my mother says, if they had any idea what I was going to end up with, they would have driven me down to those Sons of Italy dances in Spokane is what they would have done. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, my parents met at, I don't know, she, my mother was working at a cafeteria at, for the international students at, uh, at uh, Washington State University. And my father was from Hawaii and therefore an international student um, uh, in those years. And, and um my father, my mother was tells a story about, it was, it's a, I don't remember, some dull story. And she was telling me and my brother and all of his kids and, my, and his wife and everything. He was telling this story and it was a boring story and we're all listening kind of. And she says, and just think, if he hadn't said something slightly funny, which I hadn't, which I hadn't found slightly funny, none of you would be here! <laughs> <laughs> so that's how they met. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how they met. And growing up... <laughs> I, I don't want to say mixed ethnicity, but mixed ethnicity. Oh, in those days, very mixed. And yeah. it was the late, you know, it was the 60s in Oregon, and it was a thing. Yeah. You know, it was a thing. And my mom tells a story about how they they, they had to go all over. Uh, the contractor said to them, the guy who sold them the house said to them, you know, we could, you could move into certain neighborhoods, probably, or you could try. What well, these have these, you know, covenants. Mm-hmm against minorities but you'd spend all your money on um, a lawsuit is that worth yeah. it to you so they f- he found this one neighborhood and they built this house and the guy whose who's, uh, who's property was is a farmer his name was a farmer his name was uh, Mr. Cruz and I was thinking about this because this friend of mine worked in a movie called uh, about the loving case and uh, so this farmer was someone who my mom knew like she grew up with this guy I mean she didn't know him personally but she knew him mm. And like uh, he was, she could come call him on the phone and say, "Mr. Cruz, your cows are getting all over my rhododendrons." So he, next thing you know, she says, "There, there is." His hands were putting up electric fence, mm-hmm. and my mom comes out and says, "What the hell do you think you're doing? I got two young boys. What if they touch the wire?" And one of them says, "They'll only touch about the once." Yeah. And one of them says, "Oh, well, that's true." <laughs> so she gets along with that kind of. Work. So he says, "This Mr. Cruz says to her one day, 
by the way, are you married to some kind of oriental? Yeah. Is that guy some kind of oriental? And my mom says, well, yes, Mr. Cruz, uh, Walt is Japanese American. And so my mom says, you know, just, she doesn't fully tell the story, but I get what was going on in the guy's head. He, he liked my mom and he wanted to keep liking her. So he had to make this okay in his head. Mm-hmm. So he said, Ah, what the hell? The Jews are taking over the world anyway. I guess it doesn't really matter. So <laughs> my mom, exactly. So my mom exactly. So my mom says, "Well, I guess I'm just a little more optimistic about the world than you are, Mr. Cruz." He says, "Well, someone has to be." <laughs> so she came home and told that story. So that's what it was like growing up. Because yeah. she wouldn't tell me that story, but she told my dad that story, and then we yeah. laughed together. You'd filter down. Yeah. And, and, yeah. 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 Where did you um, Where did you first feel at home? God, you ask such good questions. I just wonder from Oregon to Hawaii to Princeton and New York, you had New Haven at, at some stretch. You know, I'm going to answer that question in, the, in this way. Um, when I was really aware of feeling at home, mm-hmm. um, I'm sure I felt home when I was younger, but... Um, yeah, but when you felt you belonged somewhere yes, for real. Yes, exactly. Roots, and, you know? And where I had actually set down the roots. My first semester at college in New Haven, I was really lonely, and I was... I thought, oh, I can't believe I'm here. I, I, I thought I would, you know, the usual. And then I just remember um, co- going away for Christmas vacation to visit friends who lived um, in colder parts even than New Haven. And the bus coming up to uh, to the old campus, Phillips Gate, and thinking, God, I'm home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was when the first time I felt at home. Yeah, really at home. Like, you have to feel distinctly unhome, homesick before you feel at home. Mm-hmm. So first the homesickness, then the home. And the idea of staying in academia oh. spun out of that somewhat? I mean, this is... I, that sort of community, not necessarily Yale? It was actually much more dramatic and distinct. I took a c- class when I was a freshman in college with A. Bartlett Giamatti, English 15, not English 25, and there's a big difference. English 15 is for people that don't have AP and don't have a clue. Mm-hmm. And he taught this course, and I don't know, probably 12 kids in the class, and we all sat in assigned seats, and he called roll, and he called, it mistress, called us Mr. and Miss, and he was really strict. He made a big theatrical production of that being really strict, and he was a great teacher. He wasn't a good teacher. He was a great teacher. And at the end of the semester, he slapped me on the back, and he said, Nicole, you've done well. You should go to graduate school. So I just, I, so I said to people, I always do, but Mr. Giamatti told me to do And he told me to do that, and I did. And, I, and I've never looked back. Mm-hmm. I mean, so that, you know, obviously that has to fill in for a lot of other things, but that was, that nothing else really made sense, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, nothing else really made sense. I was going to do it, you know, and I was lucky. Luck, you know, lucky. like I said, a career by attrition, career by luck, those those things really do play into this. Your um, Your literary tastes... Going, what was guiding you when you were, you know, teenage years leading up to, to college? What did you find yourself reading? Huh. I don't remember too much about high school what was guiding me except for kind of public pretentiousness. And, um, oh, and that's a huge driver. Huge, don't, don't get me huge, wrong. Huge, huge, huge. Even at college, I did the encyclopedic novel solely so that I could show people I'm reading bigger books than you're going that's to ever so read, so that yeah. way you're never going to ask me about them. I so, love yeah, it. I love Kinchin, it. Melville, all that stuff. Huh. You know, you just show up with the, oh, Jesus, I better not ask Gil because, you know, he's reading a big book. But you know what? You get a lot read that way, right? Yeah. I mean, well, I also look, and, and you, you deal with this, you know, um, you know as part of your job. The volume of reading that we could do as college students versus what we do as adults. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We don't have the time. I mean, you, you know, it's, you have a different work scenario. Oh no, than my I friend, do, but, believe me, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, when we look back and wait, I was assigned Anna Karenina for a week. You know, right? that was that was. <laughs> no, it's crazy. What I assigned these students is crazy. Yeah, yeah I don't. I don't expect, yeah. Tolstoy or Dostoevsky? Dostoevsky. Okay. Yeah. Why? Um. I just find the kind of uh, the insufferable um, you know, kind of you know, the insufferable kind of uh, uh, obsessiveness about the characters in Dostoevsky so much more persuasive, so much more mm-hmm. things I can relate to um, um, than the historicizing of. of I mean, I like. To, I mean, Tolstoy is great. But yeah, I, it's yeah. never a slight. Yeah, 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 one, yeah, yeah it's exactly. Just, what, what is why, why does one mean more to you than yeah, the other? Yeah, and just the idea that like. In Dostoevsky, that, that so much, so much can be decided. Characters can stand and fall, move toward the light or the dark on tiny little hints, little comments. 
it is always remunerative to speak to an intelligent man, you know, in the brothers, or just the little things that the that the pre. And I always think of this, like you know, the, uh, I always think of Columbo, the TV character Columbo, is kind of like the detective in um, you know, broad, but that that character, that detective character, just the little hints that he knows that the guy wants to come in from the cold. The little hints that he makes to bring him in. Mm-hmm. You know, little comments, little comments. Yeah. Yeah. I did uh, ask that question of another guest recently who answered Chekhov. Refused <laughs> to go with, like, I, I was like, yeah, but, but if you had to choose between the two, like Chekhov. Nice. I'm like, okay, there, nice. there we go. That's, nice, that's, nice. Um, one of the weird things about what, what the notes are that only occurred to me in the last week as I was, I was getting ready to, to sit down with you it's online writing, mm-hmm. which you know dominates how we we write nowadays. We're mm-hmm. writing for the internet, et cetera. Right. But it's writing without links, right? Right. Is that a uh, what does that mean? You know, writing without being able to link out to you know just some supporting line or a yeah. a, a joke that's a, a link. You know, that, that you're linking to something is actually meant. What does it mean to to be writing like that? But you know, almost tying. The internet's hand behind its back. You know, I've never terms. thought of that. I've never actually thought of it as an active strategy. But I mean, I now that you mention it, I, I, you're helping me put words to something I haven't been able to. I've never put words to before. I never thought about, uh, which is your great vocation, your great talent, by the way. Um, and that is um, the cause of greatness in others. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. In that, that well, it's you know, Falstaffian sense. That's what every greatness is, isn't it? Um, but um, you make me feel better about myself. But go on, I, yeah. <laughs> I hope so because you obviously have a gift for that. Um, um, but um, that I've always meant for this writing to be autotelic, to be for its own sake. Mm-hmm. You know that the one thing I have taken—I don't say pride in exactly—but that I've been very intent about is I don't, almost never, and and this is a very respectable. In fact, is the probably the only genuinely respectable way for uh, most um, intellectuals or academics to use um, the social media is here's something I've written there Um, or here's something that someone else has written there. Yeah, let me comment on... To be fair, that's what it usually is. Here's an article which people should read and that entrepot, I think that's so wholesome, I never do that. Right. It's always this little thing strictly for itself in itself. The notes that I have... They're not parodies. They're really notes. And I mean them to allude to something. So if someone wants to, they can go follow that up. And you include quotes. You know, you, you excerpt things in the notes itself. People can go hunt yeah. those down. But yeah. it, did you uh, unknowingly, you know, eventually come around to, oh, wow, I can't actually link this to something. You know, the reader has to go make that step. I have a never knowingly, but mm-hmm. but it certainly reinforces my main bid uh, the biscuit, my main thought about these, this writing, which is to, to use this system, this, this media, which is all about going somewhere else, and say, no, just here. Mm-hmm. Just stop at these woods, this snowy evening, just here. I ask people to sit down for an hour and listen. You know, huh. and People always tell me, oh, yeah, I listen to it while I'm driving or while I'm doing this or that. I'm like... That's not what I want. But I yeah. listen to it while I'm sitting there editing, and, and there's nothing else. Go- Even then, I'm, I'm sure I have another browser window open, and I goof around while I'm, I'm supposed to be processing and editing this whole thing. So I can't really blame anybody That's else so for having short attention span. But, yeah. That's, Do you have kids? No, no. Just, it was just the dogs. Uh, my mm-hmm. wife and I married in our mid-30s, and just neither of us wanted kids and thought, yeah, that's that's fine. I didn't. Neither of us liked being kids. We didn't like huh. kids when we were kids. Huh. So yeah, uh, we prefer being the crazy aunt and uncle. So, was that ever a uh, a thing for you? No. Although I will say this: it's funny you ask that. Um, so for the last ten years, I've been the master, or I guess we call now the head of a college, mm-hmm. and I never understood the kid thing. Um, so then I hit close to uh, fifty. Basically, it was fifty when I started almost 50, and I suddenly got it, and I suddenly had 500 kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I really feel like I don't get the I don't get the having kids so much, but I sure get the in loco parentis thing. Mm-hmm. I sure get that. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, it's not a lot, it's not a difficult thing to get. Is it something, and I don't mean it in any 
disparaging, homophobic, et cetera, way, but any regret in those terms about not having a long-term thing, not having family? Yes. yes. Yeah. Now, now, in the last few months particularly, and yeah. some various things have, con- 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 uh, have converged to make for that. Um, I've, I've worked in concert to make for this consciousness. Um, I'm about to step down as the head of the college. Um, I've um, coming out of a of a bad period of um, shall we say addictive behavior. Um, I prefer dissolute behavior. But yeah, that, highly that's dissolute, yeah. highly dissolute. Highly <laughs> dissolute. Exactly. Yeah. And and one of the one of the counselors I was seeing recently said in just this little pat phrase. I know these phrases are so pat, but you but you stay with them long enough and they can get deep. The ad- opposite of addiction is connection. So, um, um, so that's what my friend Joe said to me. And um, so, the opposite of disillusion. I mean, so the uh, you, you know you want to. I, I was always interested in talking to the kids about like why people drink so much, and it's because people don't have much time and they want to get close fast. Yeah, it's right? a great social lubricant. It's you just get close fast, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so. Weird things. I, right before you came, this ex, this this last person I was really in love with, he called. He called me on the phone from Argentina, and weird thing. This the last person that I could have actually been with, a Jewish sociologist. Um, I woke up one morning and out of the blue, the last person who I know really loved me, um, and whom I loved fully, uh, like in a real way, in a full Hamish, a full way. I wrote him a letter, and I said, Dear Jack, I have missed you a great deal recently. Um, um, I don't know how much I have changed, um, but I hope to think that some... I think that's, I like to think that some of the smallness that prevented me from being a competent lover, lover has diminished with the years. If you're interested in seeing me, please let me know, and if not, I understand entirely. But I really meant it. Mm-hmm. I really meant it. It was crazy. Heard so, back or not? No, I, I won't hear back. I did yeah, pretty I much. Know, but, you know. Um, I hold uh, my heart out that you know someday there'll be a, a happy ending. I'm kidding. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you're a good, you're a good man. So anyway, yeah. So but I but but anyway, the point is, I one of the things I'm understanding about relationships now that I didn't get when I was young, that you understand, is it's not just about um, the soundtrack romance. It's also about those moments late at night, or even early in the night when you're just too damn tired to. Do be anything other than kind of with someone else. That great line in Fitzgerald's notebook, liking a man when he's tired. Liking a man when he's tired. Yeah. You know, that, that moment, like I'm ready to like someone when he's tired. Hmm. And to be liked in turn. So that, that, I yeah. understand, yeah. And I didn't get that before. Yeah. And it's simply a function of getting tired. <laughs> uh, yeah, the age and, and yeah. the way we run down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, books that you return to, not necessarily for teaching. Do you have touchstones that you um, um, that keep changing on you? Yeah. So, um, Adam Bede. Yeah. Adam Bede a lot. You got this Elliot thing going. Yeah, big yeah. time, big time, big time. Great Expectations. Um, Pale Fire. Um, all of Merrill. Yeah, and how do they change? For you, right? So, um, you know what? I used to. I I would say this that um, it's be- how they change is. I, you know, I go to them much more now um, because the, the, the way they've changed them. Even say ten years ago, is I would go to them before to confirm something, I and mean, I go to them now to seek something because I'm not sure at all what I'm looking for, and I'm looking, and I'll find something. Uh, I, I, I used to go to think, uh-huh, just to reinforce what I thought. Yeah. Um, that makes me sound much more open than I, but, but I actually do feel like that. I, I'm, I'm much more aware of looking for clues now. Um, uh, rather than, you know, looking for confirmation. Time and ability to discover new work? I figure with a job, you know, you're precluded because you're teaching a certain set of, of works. But you know, honestly, I'm terrible at it. Yeah, that's what I, I wondered. I don't mean in any disparaging way because a lot of people we just don't have time to make discoveries at you this know, point. It's a terrible thing to admit, but like when people recommend books to me, I always feel dis- I always I always feel bad in advance because I'll never read them. Right. Um, sometimes I will. Like if I find in the basement, I'll find books um, and I'll 
and I'll like I haven't read HD for years. Look what I found in the basement. Um, or I'll, or, I'll, or years ago there was a uh, uh, the person who uh, someone who lived in this building was um, a very famous man Oliver Sacks. Oh, yeah. and you see all those penguins. Those yeah. from Okay, so he it was very kind of like Boo Radley. Like there's a basement um, bookshelf in my building and a bookshelf in the basement. And people leave things, and usually it's law texts or things like this. Um, yeah. Jane Austen and Boca. Yeah. But but this guy, this Oliver Sacks, he started leaving these little penguins one at a time. And he then he saw that someone was taking them immediately. And then he left a bunch of them. And so I got them all. So I've read these books, and these are not books that people know very well anymore. And why did I read them? I read them because I felt like he was deliberately leaving them to someone he didn't know. And I felt like that was something else. That Another was so- work of a detective? Not detective fiction, but, but yeah, exactly. trying to, to suss out clues. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. And But that he was leaving them, and there would be no test. There would be no disappointment. Mm-hmm. There would be no nothing. And I thought, well, this I know I'm not going to disappoint this person. So those I read. Yeah, but it's been a while. Movies I'll go to with, that's why it's really great to have young friends, Mm -hmm. because whether they be, or, you know, a a friend who's, uh, who writes about music, um, and he will take me, he'll drag me to these concerts. A pal of mine just emailed me on the the train down here asking if he and I are too old to recommend music to each other. And I said, yeah, there is no, there is no new music. (laughs) We're, we are old enough now that there's nothing new. We're, we're not going to have any ability to hear this. Beautiful. Well, and that's true for me, except what this kid will do is drag me to things like some some Uzbekistan pianist doing um, Schubert. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, whatever. You know, it's like, yeah. wow. Wow. Or some, there was a, recently there was a concert that this kid dragged me to. Of, of It was Beethoven, and it was Beethoven piano with somebody singing along. Mm-hmm. I don't know anything about music, but it was beautiful. It was, and it was, but it, what made it beautiful was that the, the, you know, the, the range of phenomena was very narrow. So there was a piano and there's this guy singing. And the relation between those things was, it wasn't thrilling, mm-hmm. but it was so interesting. Yeah. You know, th- those are things that like, it's, I mean, I know I have friends that will take me to things. What I have difficulty with with the books is someone will say, read this, and then they'll go away. If they stay with me. Yeah. And stand over you while you're... And read it together. That would be different. Yeah, I usually bring books as gifts of people. But I figured, uh, you know, English literature professor, you probably, as we could see, got enough books here already, plus, you know, time. So I'll I'll send you something short, maybe a Stefan Zweig thing or something like that. Oh, hey, yes. I would actually... It's funny you mention it because I have a friend who... He's married to somebody who just wrote something big about Stefan. I mean, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I I hear a lot about him. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, there's a... His final novella is... I only discovered it a few years ago, and uh, during the the Zweig comeback, yeah. And um, one of the few books that I finished and started over again uh, twenty four hours later. Uh, it's only about seventy or eighty pages, but it was one of those like, oh my god, I have to. And, and I turned it on to my. I turned my brother onto it, who's a teacher at a um, smart private high school out in St. Louis, huh. and uh, it's become a regular book for him to teach to the, huh. the, the kids now. I also turned him on to The Leopard, uh, which is a oh, one wow. that comes up here again and again uh, by Lampedusa. But he, oh, yeah. he discovered that uh, 16, 17, 18-year-olds, they don't they don't see what The Leopard is going through. Um, right. Because right. they're not middle-aged. Right. You know. The best, yeah. um, that's one of those, and I've, I've mentioned it on the show in the past, but that sense of books that you weren't ready for uh, when you first... In fact, do you have that in terms of what you're... So funny you what you're that. teaching, you know, the books that you're telling these 20 year old kids, oh, don't worry, yeah. trust me, you're going to come back to it's this so at 40 and it's going to mean the world to you. You really read my mind, my whole MO. I have a, a regular hectoring session uh, with the kids about Middle March. And I always say, <laughs> and it's so interesting, it's been one of the great, one of the great investments of my life um, was figuring this out, um, is to say, this is a novel about something you will not understand at its heart. You can't possibly understand it because it's about disappointment. It's a story of, a, of, a, of, a, of an epic whose, whose broken heart is about things like 
a guy who wants to be like a major research player. And he ends up as a my favorite of, character because yeah right yeah. right well they discovered oh, that he didn't actually produce anything uh, with uh, the uh, Casabon with the uh, oh no I was thinking about oh, Lydgate oh I was yeah. going with the, the oh, Kasabin, key to all mythologies of course Lid of course Casabon yeah. but Lydgate is so Lydgate ends up as what as the kind of uh, the kind of um, you know early nineteenth nineteenth century equivalent of a of a Upper East Side dermatologist yeah his life's fine but. He always considered himself. He always he, he he always considered himself a failure because he did not do what he had once set out to do. Mm -hmm. And so I say to these kids, you know, you won't get this, but when you do get this, write me. Now email me. Yeah. And you want to know something? They do. Yeah. I have year. I should assemble that that file. Yeah, yeah. It was maybe ten years after I graduated from, and I went to Hampshire College. Oh, really? Yeah, just uh, I went to St. John's in Annapolis for my grad no school way. As, as the opposite of, of Hampshire. Do that, yeah, yeah. Um, but I went back to Hampshire to to speak. Maybe ten years after graduation, they brought me in to do a panel, yeah. and um, my warning for the kids. This is two thousand two, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. two thousand three, uh, two thousand two, and um, I just told them, don't study something that you love really do. don't don't uh let's see you're going to end up getting a job in whatever you you focus on you're going to end up hating that job within five years so mm. don't invest too much of yourself into like one really narrow field yeah. you know learn to to learn other things yeah. and and yeah, 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 yeah. you know yeah. because again they're 20 21 22 coming from generally rich parents uh, um, they have no clue that they are not going to be happy right. holding real right. jobs right. after this as i had to to go through um Although to be fair, being a trade magazine editor isn't a real job anyway, and I was writing about car washes for the the first couple of years of my professional career. So you're happy now, aren't you? You're happy. Uh, that's the big question. Yeah. I usually ask the other person because that way they don't think to ask me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting. I, I'm much happier doing this crazy lobbying thing mm -hmm. than I am if I had stayed at the. Uh, like I talk about this with the members of my association. They always ask. So you know. Do you regret leaving the magazine yeah, 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 you used yeah. to work on? I'm like, no. I, I, if I had stayed there, the entire business model was collapsing, not for the sector it was in, but for the magazine economics. I still believe I would have been in my early 50s looking for a job, desperate and, and scared. Mm -hmm. Instead, I went off and built this thing. And as we talked about before turning the mics on, there's a sense of curiosity and learning that drives – um, people we find interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah uh, the yeah, fact yeah, that I'm learning, yeah, yeah. you know how to. Uh, I'm learning the, the the halls of Congress. I'm learning, you know, who right. you have to talk to, what right. you have to do. I'm learning how the FDA works, right. which I know sounds boring to people, no. but once you start to understand the um, the interests, the the forces, the the I, I joke that this giant negotiation I was in uh, in late 15 throughout 2016 uh, was just Game of Thrones level. Um, forces that that people were you know, trying to figure out everybody's interests and how to come up with something that sure. was going to not get anybody too disappointed. Sure. Um, which, yes, at one point I was, um, I don't want to say threatened, but there there was a point at which the stance I took would have uh, been very bad for healthcare in America, uh, which I didn't quite realize was going to have quite the, the, the impact that it did until someone pointed out to me, you know, Gil, you're actually in a position right now to destroy everything, you know, in this one area. Um, and I thought, yeah, wow. I, I, I'm wow. aware that this is a problem, but I think we're going to come to an agreement and everybody's going to be happy. So it was a little David Mamet and a little yeah. George R.R. R. Martin, I guess, in the, in the process. <laughs> but, but yeah, as far as happiness goes, um, you know, Learning, doing something like this, you know, none of us are happy. Well, uh, a lot of people I know are not happy, happy right now just because of the world as we right, know it. Exactly. Um, Besides that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? Yeah. You know, <laughs> but as far as living a life that, that I find pretty rewarding, that's, yeah, yeah. I, I've got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, even if it's juggling and spending my weekends doing this. You know, something that occurred to me, and I do far more talking in this episode than I do in most of them. Um, it's good to hear your voice. You've got a great voice. <laughs> thanks. Uh, in the past, I would come to the city, not necessarily for these, but mm -hmm. for parties with, with right, friends. Right, I'd right. be surrounded by literary, artistic people and then drive back the 25 miles to the woods mm -hmm. where I live in New mm -hmm. Jersey and uh, to the house I grew up in and feel some sense of dismay, some sense of, you know, being on the outside and, mm -hmm. and not having access to this. And over the last few years, I've realized 
these people would annoy the hell out of me the same way, much like Levin at the end of Anna Karenina. Um, <laughs> we always think, oh, no, no, this is the, the world I need to be in, or this is the moment of, of epiphany. But you realize people are just going to irritate the fuck out of you. No matter what. Yeah, it's see? so true. God, it's so true. <laughs> this way, at least I got a quiet home. I got, I right? got the deer walking through the backyard. And, That's you know, so funny. That's um, so funny. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, I realize everything's about a matter of balance, yeah. which, uh, you know, yeah. to get back to therapy, so may be the problem you've had all this time. I'm now finally going to going to reveal your character to you. Right. I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, that, that's, <laughs> well, I, I thought you weren't kidding. <laughs> and I know you're not kidding. <laughs> There's a, that, that, that sense of finding balance. Right. Um, and, and I had that in my relationships with um, with Samuel Delaney, who we were talking about earlier, who also had this very. um We'll just say basically sexually active because that's what he wrote about all yeah. these years. Um, gay lifestyle that of a necessity as you get to your seventies slows down and you start looking at, you know, who you are, what you have. Um, you assess things that when mortality starts to, to hit you. It's the reason I, I go back to this one Philip Roth novel every year because it's going to prepare me for being an old Jewish man who dies. Uh -huh. Uh, every man, one of his later yeah. very, very compact novels. Um, you know, in a sense, as I was talking about what, what appeals to me about the Iliad, I guess, is a sign of my, my, uh, death drive that Achilles acceptance and knowledge of his fate is somehow more rewarding artistically to me than Odysseus's return to, to, you know, this loving home that he had. I guess it's a sign that I'm just a, a horrible person, but you know, I, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I, I get to learn in the process of the show too. That's great. Um, Soccer, for you. you're, you're wearing a soccer jersey, oh, and I know yeah, you're no, a huge I, I Fernando Torres fan. About, okay. I, mean, I like soccer a lot, but <laughs> you just I like can, looking at the, the great players. Oh, well, a, there's two players I'm obsessed with: um, this one and uh, Ronaldo. Yeah, obsessed with them. Um, and it's just, actually, I'm not obsessed. That's not the right word because that implies a kind of like ferocity. They are the, they are the surround. They are the libidinal surround of my life. You know, those two guys taken together. They they are and. You know, I say this actually as a, um, it sounds, you know, sort of willfully eccentric, and I don't mean it that way. Um, I mean, I, it's the, 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 their ocular being is a source of great comfort for me in this world. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I um, it's not even like I feel particularly lascivious about either one of them. Um, I don't, but they're just gorgeous, and I'm just glad to know I share a planet with them. Yeah, the idea that that you know you can be in the same world as an Adonis is is kind of that's kinda... exactly right. And you know, I, I, I um, uh, you know, Torres in particular, uh, I have a whole kind of uh, this uh, allegorical relation to, like, um, you know, it means a great deal to me that he seems like a, a pious, pious Fernando, uh, that he seems like a like a good family man, that he mm -hmm. is, you know, he's, that he's that he married his high school sweetheart that. All of that is part of my little fantasy about him. You know, I mean, Ronaldo is a much like a kind of playboy. Yeah. yeah, playboy, exactly, precisely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although Lanny, I have to tell you, destroyed him for me. <laughs> he did, and Lanny, as, a, as only Lanny can. <laughs> Lanny said, I don't know, I'm beginning to feel a little bit of sort of the Michael Jackson about him, meaning that whole kind of, you know, uh, utterly self enclosed. It's, it's Har Howard Stern once pointed it out. Once celebrities start to believe they have superpowers, yeah. that's where Boom, they've gone baby. over the, yeah. They, that's Jim Carrey, Michael Jackson, guys who believe they can literally heal another human being, that's when they've lost their shit. Dude, that's a very interesting thing you've just Howard mentioned. Stern's a very smart yeah, person. Yeah, I get that, that he's like one of your major <laughs> precursors yeah, I was, in the I best. Was, Sense. Yeah, I, honestly, I was raised, I, I think, 12 Dude. years old the first time I, I heard Howard. And that so, was, oh, yeah. There was the obvious, you know, coarseness well, applause, and sex. Applause, but, yeah. applause. Yeah, no, that's nice. Understanding celebrity and the way we misinterpret what celebrity is, that's, that's. I saw that man once with his mother. Yeah. His mother calls in on the phone and she's pissed. And how much stage this was, I didn't know and I don't care. She calls in and she said, and she's. She's she's tearing him a new one for calling her a Nazi. You know, this was not at a moment where that was like a funny thing for a yeah. Jewish thing, a Jewish boy to call his mother. And at the end of the thing, whatever, however contrived this might have been, in his voice, there was there, uh, and if this was a performance, it was a magnificent illusion, a tone of genuine contrition, yeah. not guilt, yeah. just like yeah, I'm sorry, mom. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I shouldn't have said that. That's good. Pal of mine once saw Joey Ramone in a supermarket and his girlfriend, who was, I think, pregnant at the time, was pushing the cart. Mm -hmm. And the pal asked him, you know, 
you make her push. Like, I'm Joey Ramone. I can't be seen pushing a shopping cart around a, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the leather hilarious. jacket. I got the sunglasses. Hilarious. You know? That is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> They're thinking we have to live up to our images, you know. Yeah. You in the future? Me in the future. What do you see? Do you oh, have any, any projection? Yeah, any I do prediction have, I, for where you're Well, I don't have a prediction, but I have a wish. Yeah. I'd like to be a writer. I mean, a real writer. Do you think of uh, fiction at all? You know, it's funny you ask that. No. And I probably should. I don't know why I don't. Um, but I'd like to be a writer when I grow up. Mm-hmm. That's the one. It's, it's the, I mean, a, you know, a real writer. And, and I don't, you know, I've, and I'm just going to keep doing what I do. And I, you know. Are you able to, to, do you go through withdrawal if you don't write, or if you don't post a, a note for a couple of days? I don't. Okay. I don't, uh, because I don't not do it. You've I never mean, been able to, or you've never been in a position I where you couldn't. I haven't done it. Yeah. It's because I've been so hung over hmm. that I couldn't. And that's happened a few times the past few months. Don't, I quit booze like four or five years ago. Urologist advice, not any sort of huh, great bottoming out, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. no interesting stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it is kind of awesome um, because you discover that, uh, A, you never have to worry about being uh, hung over the next morning. Right. Uh, and, B, you can exert a sense of superiority over everybody, <laughs> which, you know, like I said, is sort of a recurring theme for me, like yeah, big yeah. novels, the, the not drinking. Um, that it's said, you know, I'm sure it's a lifestyle it's, it's, issue. It's, so. it's, I, the, I do feel like, uh, I'm going to say something weird about me, which is actually connected to the whole, this whole parallel universe of the internet. I know that I should say, because everyone says it and everyone, I know it's true and it sounds bizarre to say this. I'm not a competitive person. Hmm. My father used to say, that same father used to say, I see all the little boys running around and they'd say, me first, me first. And Jeff would always be saying, me second. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. And I was always second. And I always, so I'm not aware, I'm, I must be a big part of me. I just go to t- pause it. You know, it's like saying I'm not a sexual person. Of course, I, I, I recognize that I'm obliged by the conventions of our time to say that I'm a competitive person because we're all competitive. But I honestly don't feel that way. Yeah. And um, so... The, the sense of superiority that I feel that I exert, it's, I wouldn't phrase it that way. The way I would put it is that when I wake up in the morning, I realize if I'm, if I'm, if I'm lucky and if I've slept right, that I can withstand the otherwise unendurable unhappiness that I feel when I first wake up. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm aware of. And that I can get from horizontal to sufficiently vertical to write the shit. That's what I'm aware of. Yeah. Yeah. But it's funny you mentioned, I mean, it's funny the thing about superiority because I really am, that's a huge part of this project. Um, and, and that is, uh, I won't win prizes. There's no one competing with me yeah, for the, this. Yeah, the Facebook Notes Award. Yeah, Thank you. It. Exactly. <laughs> like now, I said, you're the only person on earth who figured out how to use that right? function. Exactly. So, and, yeah. you, know, so I'm, you know, when I dig deep, it's like, of course I must be. But I'm just mouthing that. I don't feel it. You know, I must, okay, I'll, I'll deduce that I'm competitive because I'm and envious because everyone says that you must be. Okay, if that's what I'm supposed to say because I'm an evolved person, I'll say it. But I don't feel it. No, you're doing yeah. this. This isn't, there's, there's no money in the I know, right? Show. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I know friends of mine who started after I did, you know, much bigger listenerships because they're focused in a particular area that yeah. they can actually, you know, I don't want to say exploit in a bad way, but they know who they're trying to reach. Um, but you're such a good-looking guy. That must help a lot. Oh, it does. Yeah. It gives me great solace yeah, that yeah, yeah. you know I can at least you know wake yeah. up in the morning and realize that ah, I can roll out of bed and still be a good-looking oh, guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, it's it's one of those. I figured this. You know, the numbers are what they are. I joke yeah. that I am never able to guess what is going to be a popular episode huh. versus uh-huh. not. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, I, I knew Harold Bloom, Clive James. Right, right, sure. Did yeah. I think Anthea Bell, the the French and German translator, was going to be like the second most downloaded episode huh. of all time? No, huh. I no, I still don't so know funny. why that that so one funny. takes off. So funny. Um, a guy who teaches at Union Theological Seminary, uh, David M. Carr, did a, a book on uh, collective trauma and the history uh, uh, and its potential effect on the Old and New Testament. Huh. I find that shit fascinating. I yeah. think it's a neat book. I sit down with him. For some reason, that's one of the most downloaded episodes last year. No idea why. No idea who's who's finding this. I know what he's got an academic title of following. The episode? Uh, it, it's just his name. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I I got rid of the smart titles I got used it, to use it, and just yeah, went yeah, to their yeah. names yeah, now. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, David yeah. M. Carr. It was that's last summer. That's very cool. But yeah, it's yeah. one of those. I'm like, listen, I want to go talk to the guy. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's going to want to listen yeah, to yeah, this. Yeah, and yeah. It, it turns out that that one 
through the roof. Um, Love it. Yeah, no idea. No idea. Love it. Yeah. Uh, last question. It's a relatively easy one. Yeah. Um, God. God. What is God to you? Love the question. Love that you think it's relatively easy. Okay, I'm going to answer that question. Sure. <clears throat> An opportunity to be grateful. An opportunity to, to actually get... You know, it's like this. What do you ask that? It's like something Fitzgerald says, and I love this line so much. He said, I've never actually wanted a God to call on. I've often wished for a God to thank. So that's really what it is to me. Like, I, you know, people always say, you know, like the meetings, they say, oh, I know everyone has a hard time with a higher power. It's like, not me. Not at all. That's the easy Not part. Not fucking at all. That's the easy part. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, God, I mean, I don't believe in any kind of God as a kind of logical necessity or anything like that. I don't believe any of that nonsense. I, in fact, when people talk about it, I just think to myself, I'm supposed to be polite the way they're supposed to be polite about someone who believes in the tooth fairy. Mm -hmm. I think it's absurd, even contemptible, because I think what it does is to fly in the face of true True religious feeling, as Wittgenstein said. No, I mean, I mean, real religious feeling, which is some, you know, what Joni Mitchell says. I send out my prayer, wondering who's there to hear. Mm -hmm. That's the only true prayer I can imagine. Not that you think he's that you've got some sort of fucking red phone, yeah. but to know that you don't. I send. You know, that's what I believe in prayer. Absolutely. I feel actually really strongly about this. I didn't realize quite so strongly until you asked the question. Um, you're right, it is a relatively easy question. <laughs> and my answer is hard. <laughs> Harder than if I needed it to sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeff Nakawa, thanks so much for coming oh on my the Virtual God, thank Memory you. Show. Thank you. And that was Jeff Nakawa. Pick up Notebook from Princeton University Press and make sure you bookmark facebook.com slash jeff.nunokawa so you can check out his notes. Nunokawa is N-U-N-O-K-A-W-A. -A. And if you're a Princeton literature major, you should study with him. Um, at least he sounds like a pretty good lecturer. Now, coincidentally, uh, my wife and I bumped into Jeff down in Princeton the day after we recorded. Uh, we were down there to record with Patrick McDonald, an episode that went up a few weeks ago. And on the walk back to the car, I saw Jeff crossing the street. So um, we said hello, got to see his home down there in Princeton. Um, the good thing is, now that you've experienced Jeff in conversation, I could not even begin to characterize what that experience was like to Amy, and so I was glad she got to meet him and get it firsthand. It saved me a lot of work in trying to kind of talk through the tone of um, Jeff's conversational style. Anyway, uh, once we wrapped up the main session, I, I did ask Jeff, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear his answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories show so you can get access to our monthly podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or or paypal.me slash vmspod. And there are all sorts of goals in place and goodies for supporters of the show, including that bonus podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, an occasional email from me saying, hey, I'm going to interview person X next week. Do you have any questions for him? Uh, also getting closer to launching a series of ebooks and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, this one was recorded at Jeff's apartment in the West Village, so that involved the standard toll at the George Washington, I think 10 or 12 bucks, about 20 bucks for parking, $6 for a round trip on the subway, and coffee at Birch on 7th Avenue. Now, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual Memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, etc., then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. The special thanks go out to Paul W. Jones, Kevin Katila, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, Craig P. Steffen, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. 
We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Now, our music for this episode was Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David has a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, and you can find out more and support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Tony Tulatamuti, the author of the great novel Private Citizens. Until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download our past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs>